All right, we're here with another episode, <laughs> OKFatal.com. Tony Mama Lou, welcome to my show. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. How you doing? How's everything? Everything's great. How about you? Everything good for you? I'm good, man. Yeah. All right, where were you born and raised? Upstate New York, by way of Gloversville. And you was raised up there too? I was raised most of my life. I spent in upstate New York, went to high school and graduated from upstate New York. And then uh, when I was about 20 years old, I moved to Tampa. That's when I started wrestling. So you didn't go to college? No. No? So you went straight from high school to move to Florida and started training for wrestling? Yeah, there was a year break in between, uh, but yeah, I went to I went to pro wrestling school instead of college. I almost went to college, uh, had it all signed up, but there was just something inside me that said this wasn't really where I was supposed to be. So that's when I took a year's break, tried to figure out what and I need to be doing or where I should be going, and I somehow fell into the pro wrestling business and. Uh, that's how I got Somehow it. fell into the pro wrestling business. So you mean to tell me you didn't think of it as a kid to want to wrestle or nothing like that? Well, uh, conventional thought would be that I was entirely too small. When I graduated high school, I was 120 pounds. Yeah. Um, so the idea of being a professional wrestler seemed to be very, uh, very far crazy fetch. and far fetched. Yeah. So I, I entertained the idea of maybe dabbling in the world of refereeing in professional wrestling. That's really yeah. the first people I ever spoke to in wrestling. I uh, explained to them I'd like to train to be a ref. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like many other wrestling fans nowadays, I was on the internet and I just happened to be searching websites for videotapes back when you collected tapes, not DVDs. And uh, someone was selling a best of Dean Malenko tape. So I emailed them and said, I'd like to buy your tape. Well, that person happened to be uh, a professional wrestler uh, who actually was being trained by Dean Malenko at the time, so instead of... Who was that? His name was Brian Burnick. Uh, you might know him from the Florida territories. I don't know. Uh, he was, uh, he had a shorter career, suffered a lot of concussions, so he kind of had to retire, but he worked out of the Tampa area for a while. He had a short stint in WCW uh, when the four of us were hired by, uh, by Chris Canyon by way of uh, DDP via Eric Bischoff when they were trying to establish a different angle where uh, Cruiser was going to yeah, go. Yeah. Nevertheless, he was the one who kind of got me really thinking about calling and, and getting involved and actually going to a wrestling school and training. What took you from upstate all the way to Florida well, to do this? <clears throat> I, I, my, the only real reason I ever got into wrestling is because I am the biggest Dean Malenko fan in the world. Oh, really? He is the reason I love the business, care about the business. I already trained you, right? Right. Yeah. Now, that happened to be a, an added bonus. I have always admired his work. He was the reason I really got into wrestling after, you know, the initial age of 12 where you kind of get out of it and whatnot and you move on yeah. with your life. But he brought me back into it with his WCW Monday Nitros and ECW runs and and so on and so forth. And when I rediscovered the wrestling industry and the business and happened to fall into uh, someone who actually knew him and passed his number on, and it just took one phone call and I knew I was going to be where I needed to be, which was in Tampa, training to be a wrestler by... So you called him from upstate and yeah. had a conversation with him and decided to go to Florida. <laughs> yeah, it was odd because... Uh, you know, for two weeks I had had the phone number, but I didn't want to call because how often do you get a phone number of someone that you very much admire, who I call yeah. my idol? Yeah, and it's happening to me now a lot, so I'm like, yeah. well, it's, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is back in the days before the internet kind of It don't matter, the world. trust me, I know what you mean. It don't matter, I don't so, care about the internet, I'm still flabbergasted. It is you know? weird, right? It's a very yeah. strange thing. Yeah. So I waited until uh, I knew he was going to be at Nitro, and I called to see if the voicemail would pick up and it would be, in fact, Dean Malenko. Because I wasn't totally sure this was legit. I didn't know the guy was giving yeah, me the phone yeah. number. And, uh, you know, it could have been anybody's phone number. Yeah. So I called, and it sounded like him. So I'm like, well, all right, maybe I'll call. So another week passed. I finally what got What you mean it sounded like? He picked up and you hung up? No, it sounded like his voice on the on the, oh, on the, the answer voice. machine. Yeah, the answer there. machine. So okay. I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe this really is Malenko. So I waited until I figured out when he should be home, off the road, and I gave a call. Yeah. And I simply asked him, are you Dean Simon? I even called him by his shoot name. And he sure enough, he answered yes. And I said, well, I'd like to be a professional wrestler, but 
I'm 120 pounds. He said, well, listen, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm not going to tell you you're going to get a job. I'm not going to get you a job. I'm not going to get you matches. I'm going to teach you how to wrestle. It's not my job for you to become a star. I'm just going to simply give you the tools to be a yeah. professional wrestler. And that's really what kind of sunk in is like, this guy is really honest with me. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really looking to do that any. I didn't. I mean, come on. I was an undersized yeah. kid all the way through my entire adult life and still, quite frankly, to be honest. And, uh, you know, it just turned out to be my gimmick. But nevertheless, I mean, this guy was being honest. So I said, all right, yeah. you know, let's just go down there and do this. So, you know, I packed my stuff the next day, sat on it for four months because I had to save up some money. And then the day that I was going to leave, my car died. So I had to wait another three months to fix it. So seven months after the phone call, I ended up being in Tampa, which actually worked out really Did well. Did you charge him? Oh yeah, I paid uh, $1,500 right up front. Otherwise you do installment payments when the school is open. For how long and like, what are you paying for $1,500? $1,500 was a lifetime membership, although of course it went out of business years ago, but basically, and that was always the standing rule with the Malenko family and their training center, is that once you paid, you could come back forever. Whenever you and, want, yeah. and, and that was another great thing about the school. Is so there wasn't a gym fee or nothing? No, nothing like that. Because Johnny Ross fee. does the same thing for 3000 but he char they charge a gym free and go in the gym that he worked for, which was seven, $70 a month or something like that. Well, I, I really Aside can't. Aside from the three Gs that you pay him to train you. Like, I can't really speak for that, but he's also running in a different type of scenario. We ran out of basically what could be considered a, a garage. Uh, yeah, that opened yeah. up on both sides. Actually, there yeah. was two schools there. One was run by uh, Steve Kern that would run after we get out, and then we had our own school from 5 to 8, and then 8 to 11, it was, it was Steve Kern's deal. But, yeah, it was, a, it was that, that was the thing. Like, Malenko didn't really care about the money. He was certainly making enough. It was really his dad's thing, and he was keeping it going. Oh, okay. And it was really a family kind of industry, yeah, like yeah. A, a business. It wasn't really a money-making scenario. So I was training for you. What was the schedule and drills like? Well... <clears throat> and how long did the training last? There was no real set schedule as far as how the long your training was. It all really depended on how quickly you learned. I mean, we went in there, and the guys that I was learning with, one of them had to be Chad Collier, we just picked up stuff like this. Yeah. So we really, we flew through the school as far as like the basic, you know. What do you call flying through the school? What do you mean? I mean, it was a great school because Malenko would go in and, and wrestle and come home and remember stuff and train us on the stuff and then go put it on TV. So we just went through, you know, all kinds of different moves and whatever. You know, the man of a thousand yeah, holds yeah, quite yeah. literally doesn't do a justification. Yeah. But there wasn't drills. We didn't do cardio. We didn't do weight training. It was yeah. simply like he said and like he did. He was straight up. It was all about wrestling. Yeah. If you want to get in shape after the fact or before the fact. So he taught you, you psychology. Yeah. He taught you kayfabe, your carny lingo, everything. Uh, not so much the carny lingo because at that point it's really a died out. Uh, so you never learned that at all? Not not officially. Oh. I've, I've caught up. Kayfabe? Yeah. He taught I mean, you that? Yeah. Malenko didn't. Malenko never looked at the business like the way you know maybe his dad might have. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. He he certainly respected that approach. He mostly. But he kind of understood. Wanted to train you to wrestle. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, I got you. I teach you to wrestle. That's what you will learn. And I got that you. Certainly was the case. All right, your first break was in WCW. How did that come about? Uh, another again another happenstance. Everything that's ever really happened to me in a positive has always been a happenstance. Um, Eric Bischoff and had this idea that he was going to create a, a, a cruiserweight show that kind of was similar to a, a loosely based version of the Power Rangers, if you can believe that. <clears throat> so he uh, in, invested the charge of Chris Canyon to go around and find new, younger cruiserweights that aren't necessarily luchadors and or, you know, an Eddie Guerrero type. So uh, Malenko had heard about that, and he told one of the guys that was one of my roommates, Jeremy Lopez, to, hey, why don't you send a tape up here to WCW, <coughs> excuse me, and I'll pass it on to Kenny. Great. Well, I didn't get that phone call and, you know, whatever, uh, but I happened to be on Jeremy's tape, so that led Kenny to say, well, okay, 
I like both of these guys. So you didn't even know Kanye? Anyway. I didn't know him at all. I, I never met him. Because I heard the story. I thought you knew him at the time. I met him after this fact. Yeah. I didn't know him at all before this. I thought you did. No, that's, un that's, wow. that's not true. <clears throat> so, that led, one thing led to another. That's when Brian Burnett got involved. So also he picked you by, by eye. Right. Wow. Right. And that's also how he discovered Jamie Noble too. We were all on the same. We, Canyon too. Yeah, we we all worked the same territory in Florida together. We, you know, one would wrestle one guy. You know, like every other. It was more condensed nowadays. Yeah. It's unlike up here where everybody runs a show. But you know, we just did the 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 tours around, and you know, so we were always on each other's tapes and whatnot. Yeah. Can you speak on Canyon? Um, before he passed, I, I was on a show where. Where you was there and he was there, and I think I had this conversation with you. He was telling me that you were staying with him at the time, and this was about a month before he passed. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you speak on him and living together almost at the time of his death? Well, it wasn't the first time I was ever uh, living in the same house. Um, when I got hired by WCW, he invited me and Jeremy to live in his basement. Oh, yeah? And, yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Sorry. So we lived, uh, you know, we lived there for a few years, actually. You know, because right after we got hired, very shortly thereafter, we were released. So we didn't have a whole lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So we had to kind of, you know, that's where I based my time out when I was in ECWs. I lived in Atlanta. So I knew Canyon on a very personal level. Yeah. Uh, from that experience from the WCW days and, of course, after the fact. And, and when I moved away from that area, when I met my would-be wife, and we moved upstate, we kind of separated as far as he was, you know, off kind of doing his own thing, and moved to Florida, and uh, we were upstate, so we didn't really keep in close contact. And uh, I reached out to him, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, to see what was how he was doing, and he indicated that he was trying to open up a wrestling school here in New York City, and he asked if I could help him. Well, I certainly owed him a favor or two. So, you know, after a few t few months of really planning and getting ready to do this, we decided, okay, if we're going to really do this, then we need to kind of live in close proximity. But yeah. you know, New York City is not the easiest place to get an apartment. <coughs> so we moved in. I moved. Me and my wife moved down there, at least for a little while, when we were staying in his house, in his apartment in, in Sunnyside, yeah. and that's how I was living there. It, it was, you know, unfortunate because he was definitely going through some difficult times. Did you notice it at the time? That's why I wanted to ask. Did you notice him going through? Because I, I, had, I had a long conversation with him that that day, and it was, like I said, about a month before he did that. And he seemed all right, man. He seemed all right. He didn't seem like he was very depressed. We talked about his depression, but he didn't. He seemed okay, man, you know, and it was real surprising to me that. Oh, uh, well, I mean, sh I mean, the guy that I first met. Uh, maybe 10 years before and the guy that I had you know come to discover was certainly a different person uh, the depression yeah. and the effects of you know of that really had taken hold you know, in a strong way now there were you know days and even moments that were of, you know okay yeah but I would be you know I'd be lying so you if did I said see I you didn't know it was, it was clearly obvious yeah. like, Wow, man. It was, it was like, sad. I, I'm telling you, I had a comment, and I would have never known. Like, I would have never known. Like, 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 you, you. you know, you live with a guy every day. Yeah, you yeah. see somebody every day. I mean, we, my wife and I, that, it was very difficult on us to just watch. I can't imagine being him. Really? Yeah, because we knew Chris when he was Chris Canyon. Can you give an example? What kind of, like, anything? Any oh, example? well, the worst was the fact that he would stay in bed for several days. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You know, classic. <coughs> I apologize for sorry. Don't worry about it. Classic signs of depression. Deep depression. Yeah. You know, and uh, days. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. You know, and the worst. Wow. Thing. And that's why I hate that show, King of Queens, because it would constantly be on, and he would play it at such a very low level you couldn't even hear it. It was just simply a matter of just a very low volume. <coughs> and uh, and just so that there was something, you know, I guess. You know, kind of going on in the room, but it it and, yeah, it was it was sad. Yeah. And this is a guy that got me into WCW, introduced me to yeah, a lot of know. people who became a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and to see someone fall that far, uh, you know, it, it's sad. And a what lot do you think of it, made him so depressed? <clears throat> well, 
you know, this business is not for everyone, and the people that are in it are not like everyone else. You just, uh, to explain it is impossible, because you have to only live it to understand it. I can't tell you why I wrestle, because it wouldn't make any sense to I'm not understand what you're saying. So, when you take away something so very uh, emotionally attached to your, your everything in your life, then what do you got? Because most of the guys in this business, we live the business. Why would you say it was taken away? There's a lot on indie circuits right now. That he could have, he could have made a living. I think he could have made a living. Well, you know that when when you have danced on the biggest stages, yeah. and it just ends one day, it's over. Yeah, that's hard. It's happened to me. I've been fired so many goddamn times. I can't tell you how many yeah, times. Yeah, imagine, about. man. I, I could adjust to it because I didn't experience. I mean, this is a guy that was on TV for ten years. Yeah. And, uh, and then one day it was over. And that was hard for him to deal with. You know, you have people, and, and you know, he didn't necessarily have really a job that he could go back to and reference prior to wrestling. An odd job here or there, but I mean, as far as like he basically. He had a profession. He was making, I think, $70,000 a year before he started wrestling. Yeah, but that was for a very brief period of time, and if you ask me, he hated every second. So oh yeah, he, yeah. He didn't want to really go back to that. Yeah. And, uh, what was it again? He did. Uh, he was a he was a uh, physical therapist. Yeah, I'm with so much doctor. Buffalo for so it, so so Buffalo, but that was never his calling or passion. So yeah. when you took away someone's calling or passion, it's very hard to really adjust to this world. That's why wrestling is very different than other forms of entertainment because it is so very it is so very disconnected from everything else that you quite you can't really relate to anything. So from what it sounds like to me, not for nothing, I think, you know, I, I don't even want to say it, but you know what, I'm going to say it because it is what it is. From from what it sounds like to me is that um, he needs to just be a man, man, you know? Like, that's life, you know? Like, that don't make no <coughs> sense. I'm like, you letting, letting it get to you, you know? Like, that don't make no sense. Be a man. Right. Stand on your two feet, you know? That's... A bullshit excuse to me, you know. You see, but that, you see, that's an outsider perspective. You you, you can't. Well, you really can look at understand. anything in life. Like, uh, come on. Um, if you want to get into my life, you know, my mother was a drug addict, you know, and come on, like I could have used that and like. Well, I mean, uh, I would never sit here and call Chris Canyon anything other than you know he's certainly a man. He had difficulty adjusting to reality. Some people can adjust better than others. Do you think Ric Flair can adjust to reality? He's been a nature boy for 30 years. I think that's part of being a man. I think if he can't, then he needs to grow the fuck up. Well, that's your Any opinion. Any man. Well, that's Honestly your opinion. Speaking. I mean, you're, 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 you're trying to justify someone else's life without having lived it. I mean, that's not fair. No, I'm not justifying nothing. I'm just saying that, <coughs> you know, that want to wrestle or nothing like that. Well... Uh, conventional thought would be that I was entirely too small when I graduated high school. I was 120 pounds. Yeah. Um, so the idea of being a professional wrestler seemed to be very, uh, very far crazy fetch. and far fetched. Yeah. So I, I entertained the idea of maybe dabbling in the world of refereeing in professional wrestling. It's really yeah. the first people I ever spoke to in wrestling in my life. I spent in upstate New York, went to the high school, and graduated from upstate New York, and then uh, when I was about 20 years old. I moved to Tampa, that's when I started wrestling. So you didn't go to college? No. No? So you went straight from high school to move to Florida and started training for wrestling? Yeah, there was a year break in between, uh, but yeah, I went to I went to pro wrestling school instead of college. I almost went to... Alright, we're here with another episode, <laughs> NoCaseFavor.com, Tony Mama Luke. Welcome to my show. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. How you doing? How's everything? Everything's great. How about you? Everything good for you? I'm good, man. All right, where were you born and raised? Upstate New York, by the way of Gloversville. And you was raised up there too? I was raised most... I uh, explained to them I'd like to train to be a ref. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like many other wrestling fans nowadays, I was on the internet and I just happened to be searching websites for videotapes back when you collected tapes, not DVDs and uh, someone was selling a Best of Dean Malenko tape, so I emailed them and said, I'd like to buy your tape. 
Well, that person happened to be uh, a professional wrestler. The college uh, had it all signed up, but it was just something inside me that said this wasn't really where I was supposed to be. So that's when I took a year's break, tried to figure out what and I need to be doing or where I should be going, and I somehow fell into the pro wrestling business, and uh, that's how I got somehow it. fell into the pro wrestling business. So you mean to tell me you didn't think of it as a kid to one?